this project, uh, they have about six six days, six, uh, six class p- periods, because um, we only meet four days a week um, in each class. So there's about six class periods, but they do a lot of it at home. They, they don't do it in in class. They do some of it in class, but they um, they are. I mean, there's they're right now they're brainstorming, outlining, sketching. Like the beast is actually. This was the pighead, right? Pighead on the stick is actually communicating with him. Yeah, totally. That's what it is. It's the pig. No, some people might know. Hey, some people think it might. It's okay to think it, it got a little sci fi last night. It got a little no. sci fi. How many of you think it got a little sci fi? I did. I'm working with you. Right. Explain to us how it got a little sci fi. Well, I feel like he wasn't necessarily scared, but. Or he wasn't. Um, crazy, but he was more scared, and that kind of like messed with his um, like psychology. And he was like, "Okay, we gotta go up the uh, mountain because I feel like he was nervous that the beast was gonna come down." I think honestly, I think it's just a health issue. I think maybe he wasn't getting enough to eat, or maybe maybe he's like dehydrated. I think maybe he was just hallucinating because. Jack was saying, like after later on, he was like, um, "Come over to our camp because we have a lot of like fresh food and, and we have this whole pig body." And like all the little kids were like, "Ooh, that sounds really good," as if like they haven't eaten in a long time. So I think Simon was just hallucinating. I think that Simon in general is just like a little bit unstable and I think that he probably was unstable before the island as well because he sort of thinks like on a different level than some of the other boys in like numerous places in the book he just acts a little bit different than you would think like the average 11 or 10 year old would. And Simon tends to more, he thinks more about the outside of the box and maybe this will happen, maybe this will happen, maybe this will happen and it kind of drives him nuts. Well, the way that he was raised, he was already in isolation, which made him already like think more philosophically and more about the future. I'm going to have to, you said the word I was waiting on. Give me some love. Right here. Here. Sorry for the language. Um, For English, we're doing a storybook and we all have to create um, a story structure about it has to be for children ages 5 to 10 I believe so I mean it's just you're writing the book and you're going to give it to the teacher and Mr. K my English teacher is going to bring in um, kids so that they can review our books. (laughs) Um, I liked the uh, I think it was last year I got to do a project where the teacher she we read Macbeth, so she gave us like free range. She's like, "All right, show me something from Macbeth that you like to do." So, I wrote about Lady Macbeth and her personal plans for Mac, her her husband, Lord Lord Macbeth, and I wrote it in diary entries that she would have written. And I took a lot of time in it, and I like soaked the paper in coffee and made it look really, really old because the book like takes place in like 1400s England so I spent a lot of time working on that project and in terms of that I really was proud of it and I think that's another benefit of project-based learning is that you become really proud of your work because it's something that you're interested in that you get to pick. It's great. I suggested that because he was trying to see if we read or not, instead of doing it with a point system like out of 10, it was a pass or fail. And so if you get enough of the questions right and show that you understand the text and have read it, then you can get a passing grade. And if you just show that you are completely guessing and don't really understand or haven't read at all, then you fail. Um, I feel like that would still favor people with photographic memories because it's still, it sounds like it'd still be the same questions. So, um, I personally have trouble remembering details. So the quizzes are either a big problem or not a big problem for me, depending on the quiz. 
So I feel like um, the I feel like a great way to see if someone would read the text is just give them five minutes to write down everything they remember. Mm. Well, that's worse. No thoughts. Again, no bad ideas. We're kicking it around. Uh, none of you are professional teachers, but you're smart people. I want to hear what your ideas are. I want to see what you have. Yeah, go ahead. Me? I think like, the pass and fail thing is kind of like really harsh because like you can get like an 80 and that's still like passing, but you don't completely understand it. And the kind of like a suggestion that I have is like what we kind of did last year with the Odyssey where like we had to take notes on the book and then our notes would be checked to make sure that you read. But like this time we actually like read through the notes and have to like show our notes and have people put through them so they actually make sense. Like, you can write about like, writing, I don't know, five minutes or something. No right or wrong opinions here. Yeah. Um, I think that Maybe for you as a teacher, the like pass fail thing would be good, good because just in team, like maybe not for the teachers, <laughs> but just in team, like when a teacher first well on and read something, you can tell if there's a kid read this or kid didn't read this, so it would be easy to just go like pass or fail like it would be up to you. Um, or maybe just having kids write down like five questions related to the book instead of five answers. Oh, wow. Why? Yeah, why? Why on that one? That's interesting. Um, because even if people have, like, a photograph memory, it's passing fail like, it's still more important to remember what they read so that you can kind of see, like, your overall picture of the... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At least my I, I, kinda, I I'm like seeing everything now, so like, Ooh. like like yeah. Like, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> You're a recent enlightenment. Have you walked out of the cave? Exactly. <laughs> so um, like the pass and fail thing sounded good at first, but then I thought about it again, and it was like, like I think that who said Jess that it was kind of harsh, and um. It's interesting that you would go harsh on that. What do you guys think is the value in remembering that thing? Yeah, that's I, I think that's where. Let me actually color Zach's question with what I think the value is, and then you tell me if it holds water or not. My reason for doing it is that one is a reading check, and as you can tell, you're starting to get to the complexity of doing a reading check. Um, Second, though, is to reward kids. Not as much about punishment, because I figured kids who aren't read don't do well in the class anyway. Like, that's not a, they, I don't need to punish kids who don't read. They also write bad papers, and they also write, like, there's other things. (laughs) I don't have to worry about that. It's rewarding kids who are um, taking the extra initiative. There are, there's, there's, there's reading the text, and then there's, taking your time, sitting down, trying to pull out and discern what is important and what is not, the different details, which tends to also lead to writing better essays because you, re- you have recognized things that other people didn't recognize because you took your time. Uh, I was thinking since you want to reward the people who actually read, uh, I was thinking maybe you can give them like a little bit more credit. So like if you got a partial wrong, you got no score, that won't bring the grade down. But if you get on the question right, you got points, and that will bring the grade up. So like the uh, standardized test y'all just took? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if we can find a mode of assessment where I can rightly judge who read and who did not, which actually seems very simple, right? Where I can rightly judge who read and who did not, where it is the appropriate amount of work intensiveness for all of you and for the grading team. If y'all can think of something and y'all agree on it, like vote, figure out, I'll do it. That's the challenge. I'll do it. Because um, as you could tell, our kids are really, really aware of and alert of how they're being assessed. Like Sorry. they, it's not just something that's happening to them. It's something that they are actually contributing in. And so I was impressed that they were thinking so much about the efficacy of what, the, of what we're doing. And so I want to encourage that. And so 
Yeah. I oh, yeah. need them to feel like it's okay for them to talk to me. And, and as you can tell, they actually came to real. I was actually teaching because they actually came to some realizations during the conversation. They're like, wait a minute, I know how this works. Wait a minute, I understand. So I was actually very, very happy with um, how that worked out. We can tell you what thriving at SLA means, right? We can tell you what graduating from SLA means. Graduating from SLA means that you are ready to tackle problems. It just means that you are a powerful, critical thinker. It means that you have the ability to stand in front of a room or walk up to a person and speak your mind and your ideas and back it up with evidence and, and, and a powerful argument. It means that you can create a, across multiple media. Um, it means you can do all, it means you're ready to, for whatever is next. That colleges are hungry for the kind of kids who are more well-rounded than the score on a test. And they challenge the system in healthy ways. Right.